Welcome back to Night Mine, friends. I hope you've all had a nice rest as of late, settling into the season and the spirit. I know I needed it myself, because the topic waiting for us tonight is quite the adventure and requires ample energy and focus to tackle. Working on a steady beat, right? That's the key, and we have our friends at Raycon to thank for assistance in that department, who are back to sponsor tonight's video. I've mentioned before how useful I find Raycon's everyday E25 earbuds. They're wireless, they fit perfectly, they sync up to Bluetooth faster than anything I've ever connected my phone to, you get an immediate audio notification they're connected and ready to go, and the sound is excellent. I've also connected to my desktop via Bluetooth for some late nights editing audio tracks, which keeps workflow clear of external noise and isolated to just my ears. And with the way my work sessions run, the E25 earbuds bring what I'm after with 6 hours of continuous playtime and bass levels that hit. The carrying case itself is the charger too, which is incredibly smart. Starting at about half the price of any other premium wireless earbuds on the market, Raycon's everyday E25 earbuds are a great holiday gift, and now's the time to get the best prices of the year. Go to buyraycon.com slash nightmind or click the link in the description box to get 15% off your Raycon purchase. But do hurry, this is a limited time offer. Remember, that's buyraycon.com slash nightmind, or just click the link in the description box. Thanks to Raycon for sponsoring this video, the offer of 15% off a new Raycon purchase, and being here just in time for holiday shopping. Now, speaking of holidays, let's talk about something that makes my spirit bright. Serial killing. I do love to bring up old stories and experiences, especially the bigger completed ones, lost to time and memory. And tonight's case is tied to memory of source material that has recently been revived. News broke this October that the hit Showtime original Dexter is getting a limited run revival next year. As a consequence, a lot of people have suddenly remembered Dexter or started watching the series for the first time. And now I get to introduce you to something totally unexpected, the forgotten Dexter ARG. Some call it F8, Fate, some call it Infinity, but those who took part would just call it their own personal season of Dexter. The majority of information logged on this experience comes courtesy of the player Angel No Relation, who kept a timeline on her blog. While the blog itself seems unreachable now, the Internet Wayback Machine has it archived, which means we can follow the story beat for beat. Before we proceed, major thanks to Angel for the dedication to record keeping. Your detective work would make Batista proud. In the header, here lies the summary. We find the game began on Friday, July 23rd at Comic-Con 2010. The kickoff was an area of the con Showtime established, the San Diego Kill Room, which would only be open for two days. It was advertised as being involved with Dexter, but without any title beyond that. Aside from a journey into the Grizzly Kill Room, which you can see video footage of here, visitors were given business cards leading to the website SerialHuntress.com, owned by ex-FBI agent D. Pratt who believed crowdsourcing could help solve murders. There's a YouTube channel that includes all her video content as well, where she posted as the game went on. Welcome to Serial Huntress. That's me, but you can call me Dee if the nickname scares you. So, Serial Huntress. Basically, the concept is this. Me, finding serial killers in a completely new manner than it's ever been done before. Don't get me wrong, I'm not going all vigilante and taking matters into my own hands. It's actually the complete opposite. I'm coming up with a new system, and I'm calling it crowdsourced crime solving. I'm going to share all of my cases with you with as much evidence as I can get clearance for without putting anybody in harm's way. You can see everything on the site, SerialHuntress.com. The latest investigation is tracked on the blog, complete with weekly video briefings from me, and all of the evidence and information is filed under the dossier tab, so you can keep track of the case no matter where you've been. If you have something to contribute, you can post to the forum, post your thoughts, post your videos, post your photos, post your links, post anything that you think might be relevant to the case. That's it. Welcome to Justice by All. Immediately, you can gauge how this setup works for an ARG. Whenever a lead dropped, players could investigate, report their findings to Agent Pratt, and secure new evidence-based movements on her side of the story. Clues at the kill scene offered more information. An infinity sign painted in blood on a mirror, as well as several letters. Put together, they spelled, Sleep Superbly, which led to a website by that name. 
It was also advertised on sleep masks being handed out around the convention center on the kill room's second day of operation. Accessing the premium membership area of the site revealed a dream session posted by a user named F8, speaking to a confidant or therapist named Iris. The user describes a dream in which he met someone odd, but a bit rude, refusing to introduce himself or talk, just sitting in a chair, not moving. It was a good dream though, compared to dreams he experienced of losing teeth. A reflection of the computer monitor and the user's glasses pointed out a Twitter handle, at your name, your life. Visiting revealed a game proposed by the user, going by Pseudonym. I have a little riddle for you. Seven clues, one every eight hours. DM the right answer and I'll give you a treat. Of the three, I am the last. Forrester sent me to Gibraltar. I am the ancient with a tangled sky. I choose not who or when, but how. Through me comes man's most superb sleep. Not by spindle nor rod, but by shears do I work. I am the inexorable, the inevitable, the unturning. Who am I? Pseudo Nim announced a few participants who guessed correctly, then declared on July 30th the riddle had been solved. Not all questions were answered, but he trusted we'd enjoy piecing things together. Perhaps we will meet again, under different circumstances. The answer was Atropos, the third of the Greek fates, known as death. Pseudonym's treat, for those who guessed correctly, was a link to an audio recording of the murder in the San Diego kill room. be missing a few pieces. If it's any consolation, it makes you an even more exciting puzzle. Now, I know, I, I know that you would love to live to tell the tale, but the tale will be told. Rest assured. Even the tale that you spent so many years keeping quiet. You! You played well. Remarkably, even. And there were so many eyes on you. But all with hands tied behind their backs. And now your hands are tied. The hands that held the lives of so many are going to give away your little secrets. Now, I admit, I, I enjoy the irony. Just... Look at how much effort I put into our meeting. I only have so few left. I, I had to take my time. Now, if you're trying to tell me how you've never killed anyone, don't bother. It's all semantics to me. You felt the thrill. You bought into the illusion of being the puppet master pulling the strings. Well, my friend, your string's about to get cut. <laughs> Serial Huntress provides the next bit of action in a video update. Hey guys, thanks for joining us again this week. We've had an interesting turn of events. An old colleague of mine has asked me to consult on this case, and I gotta say, I've seen some shit in my time, but this one even has me surprised. So a few days ago, the police discovered a body in San Diego. The thing is, there's no way to ID this guy. I'm talking some seriously crazy shit here. Face was mutilated, teeth were pulled out, fingertips carved off. This is some nasty shit. The strangest part is, the guy had strapped him into an old dentist chair in a room surrounded by mirrors. It was almost like he was forced to watch himself being tortured. I mean, that's just wrong. So we also found these letters scattered throughout the scene and what appears to be an eight or an infinity symbol. But here's what really interests me. Police also found these cuts on the victim's fingers. So here's the deal, I'm not sure what the hell this means, but obviously the killer wanted us to find this. Could be that he's just trying to f*** with us. I don't know, but maybe he's trying to communicate. That's where you come in. I need as many eyes on this as I can possibly get. What does this mean? What am I not seeing? This is it. This is what Justice by All is all about. If you learn anything, post it on the forum and be sure to check our blog for updates. Otherwise, happy hunting. Players had an opportunity to provide the connective tissue for Sleep Superbly to the Huntress while checking out information she brought to the table. 
Already, the give-and-take nature of this mechanic was underway. A study of Serial Huntress's evidence revealed that cuts on the victim's hands composed a phone number, belonging to Bor Skousa of Illinois. Accessing his voicemail led to messages that informed players Boris's identity had been stolen. Google searches for his name turned up a blog called Unpersonated, which Boris used to report his misery in trying to get back his ID. The only lead he has comes from a report that his identity thief tried to buy a used car in Seattle at a place that went out of business. Emailing the old owner at the used car site and asking about the incident revealed the identity thief as Matthew Clark, whose associated home address was an abandoned lot. Bringing this to the attention of Serial Huntress, players received a response. She looked into it and confirmed that Matthew Clark, the identity thief, was the victim of the San Diego kill room. That solves one half of the mystery, but what about the other? On Sleep Superbly, the user F8, our presumed killer, uploaded a new video therapy session in which he scares the player base by directly mentioning meeting new people. Angel No Relation, the player who ran this timeline, and another, Diablo Brian. He delighted in how funny it was that he now associated with both an angel and a devil. The writing on the handle of the mug says, Who Controls You?, leading to a Twitter handle by that name. It's for a website, Control Addicts, offering an 8-step program to help people who feel they're addicted to control. Players were invited to sign up and take a control pledge on Twitter admitting they're powerless over their addiction, at which point they would be contacted for the next step. Players had to admit in a tweet tagged Control Life that they were never fully in control of their lives. In other words, entirely susceptible to fates. They would then need to inventory what they thought they controlled, photograph the list, and tweet it. A follow-up picture was requested of the ashes of the list after burning it. Step number six was to make amends. Create an apologetic e-card and tweet it to a friend you tried to control, tagged hashtag control sorry. Step seven involved players filming themselves doing what a stranger told them and to tweet it with hashtag controlless. The final step, number eight, would be submitting to the control of a higher power and tweeting that power to the account with hashtag control free. Those who completed the program would receive a message congratulating them on living a life outside their control and offering a link. Viewing the source code for the page in the link revealed an audio file, the recorded death of another Infinity victim. There. Isn't that better? You are getting a little bit agitated. Now this won't hurt a bit. I wonder if you're having some form of revelation on this ultimate high of yours. I hope you are. It's a bitter taste, I'm sure, but you should feel a little bit wiser, a little bit more humble. You had your time at the top of the food chain, but as you can tell, arrogance can really eat you up. One more quick sting. Almost done. Well, wow, you've been a real treat. And I admit, I doubted myself for a second that you were so hard to get to, but that's also why you were the logical next step. One last pinch. You won't feel a thing. I'm sure of it. As before, Serial Huntress provides an update, establishing a pattern of challenge and reward in the game at event points. Hey guys, welcome back. First things first, I'm fighting a nasty virus this week. I don't know what it is, but I'm working from home, so... Welcome to my humble abode. If my doctor knew this, he'd have my ass. I feel like shit. Different story. Couldn't let that stop me from bringing you the latest information. So, on to business. So I mentioned last week that there were some past cases which we believe are linked to the Infinity Killer. I was going through some of these. Something interesting happened. One of these murders happened in Miami in November of 08. Apparently the police down there were tracking this big-time drug dealer named Santos Jimenez. They found his body with eight syringes stuck into it. He died of a massive heroin overdose, but curiously, he was also gagged with this 
eight ball concoction, which we believe is meant to be his infinity symbol signature. So anyway, as I'm trying to get information out of the local police, this guy contacts me, he says he's the victim's lawyer. And he tells me that Santos actually had some corrupt police working for him. And as an insurance policy, the man had bugged his own house so that he could record any incriminating conversations, you know, in case things ever got too hot. Get this, the lawyer actually had possession of those audio files. The man had never given them to the police because I guess he figured they'd just destroy him anyway. Well, guess what? Now I have them. It was recording on the day of the murder. So this just came through today. I haven't even had a chance to listen to it yet. I'm going to check it out, but honestly, I've had a fever of 102 for three days, and I'm probably going to miss some stuff. So I need you guys to step it up here. You did some fantastic work last week, and I expect you to keep it up. I need you to listen for anything, anything that might help us. This is completely unexplored territory here. If you find anything, post it onto the forum. Let other people know. Together we can figure this out. I'm going to need all the help I can get this week, okay? Thank you. Happy hunting. Oh, you guys have any good home remedies for the flu? Bring them. The name of the victim, Santos Jimenez, is curious. It's precisely the same as an infamous character in Dexter, but one who met a much different ending a year before Infinity's victim. It's unknown if it's just a nod to the show's storyline or if this was Santos Jimenez Jr., but the evidence supplied by Huntress didn't leave players stuck on the issue, since there was new material to examine. Recordings in the home reveal two things. He absolutely had cops on his payroll as part of a drug runner scheme, and he called in a problem with his home security system, asking the company to send Regis Piscina to help fix it. Regis Piscina was found on Facebook, a Brazilian man who was out traveling and could only be followed up with at his travel blog, Global Nomad. A picture on the blog showed off his phone and number. Calling the voicemail instructed players to leave their email address. An email exchange between a player and Regis followed, with Regis bewildered about how this person got his number and why they're asking about Santos. After a couple of emails back and forth, Regis explained the connection. In Miami, I was working for a security business. I was sent off into the home of Mr. Jimenez. He was nice to me, but I did not know him well. Last time I go there, a man attacked me from the back of my van and choked me until I passed out. Later, I wake up in the back of my van and my uniform shirt was away. I did not see much of the man, only for quickly in the rearview mirror. He was big, I think tall, with brown hair and light maroon eyes. Santos was a good man. I am sad that he is now gone, but I could not tell the police because I was not legal for work. I am very sorry, but I did not want to be sent away. I hope you find your person. Another victim revealed, another meeting on Sleep Superbly. Infinity sits down to tell his therapist, Iris, that his new friends had him all tied up this week. I think we're starting to see eye to eye. He mentions hearing an owl in his dream the other night, and it really stayed with him upon waking. This time it was a TV in the background blinking in Morse code that gave players their next lead on Twitter, at Semper Fate. Difficulty curve was stepped up for this one. The only tweet read, Kilo Romeo Juliet, Hotel Oscar Juliet Kilo Mike Kilo, November India Papa. Players took that military alphabet speech, used a substitution cipher, and got the word onomatopoeic. The final name of the avatar, which is the symbol of the Navajo code talkers, seemed like a mess, but the code talkers were the key. The file name translated to Hoyardley, a well-known cryptologist. That led to the website Hoyardley.com, showing a Morse code paragraph in a highlighted section that read, Dynamite. The entire code was a quote from Frederick Nietzsche. I know my fate. One day there will be associated with my name the recollection of something frightful, of a crisis like no other before on earth, of the profoundest collision of conscious, of a decision evoked against everything that until then had been believed in, demanded, and sanctified. I am not a man, I am dynamite. The Huntress also uploaded a picture of Santos Jimenez's security system error screen at this time that displayed a binary code message. This is the part where you take my bait and call a technician, then I intercept him, take his uniform, come to your place, you unsuspectingly let me in, and your fate becomes sealed. 
Huntress provides her third briefing next. Hey guys, welcome back. I'm feeling much better this week. Degravity, that lacto remedy worked like a charm. Thank you. All right, here we go. As detectives, we obviously have to keep our minds open about this case and consider all possible avenues. But I have to say, after reviewing the past two victims, an identity thief and a drug dealer, I am leaning towards the theories that some of you guys are putting out there that our guy's a vigilante. With this new case, though, I don't know. I'm not completely sure what to think. Victim's name was Joe. Actually, Colonel Joe Wellmont. But from what I can tell, he's completely clean. No criminal record, no issues with his military files, nothing. Police discovered the colonel's body in the woods near his house outside of Illinois in August of 09. The killer recreated a military-style firing squad, except there was only one shooter. He used a 308 rifle, and the colonel died of a gunshot wound to the chest. That was grisly. I'm not going to show you guys that. It's intense. So I've been doing some digging into the colonel's life, and I managed to track down a former neighbor of his, Jenny. Now, she didn't know all that much about the colonel herself, but she managed to point us in the direction of somebody who might. He has his brother. He is homeless a lot, so he'd stay with Joe sometimes. He was weird. I think he had some psychological issues. So this guy was apparently on and off the streets, in and out of shelters. The police never talked to him because they couldn't find him. Of course, they don't have my crowd resources, now do they? This is where you come in. We need to talk to this guy. And compared to the other two cases, this one just doesn't seem to fit. And we'll never track down our killer if we can't figure out his M.O. So look, Jenny says an old acquaintance, this woman Rebecca Gladow, actually used to volunteer at a shelter where Heath came in and out of. Of course, Jenny, bless her heart, doesn't have so much as an email address for Rebecca, and that's where you guys come in. I'm going to need you guys to get to her, and when you do, find Heath. When you find Heath, talk to him about the colonel. See what you can find out. That's it, guys. Go hunt. Huntress uploads a clip of her interview with Jenny, which turns up the name of a friend of the colonel's brother, Rebecca Gladow. She had a Facebook page, which led to the homeless shelter she worked at, New Promise Harbor. Phone calls to New Promise got results. Conversation with a worker revealed that Rebecca hadn't been there for a few months and the colonel's brother, Heath Wilmot, was currently in a sanitarium. Emails to the sanitarium's website are fielded by a secretary named Judy, who will only offer information to family members or next of kin, who have proof. It's not stated how one of the players passed this skill check, but they did succeed, and were told Heath died of natural causes, but if an address was provided, they would send his belongings. At the same time, the remaining mystery behind the Semper Fate Twitter account is solved, leading to the Fucuro.net, dedicated to 17th Airborne Division 8th Brigade Compact Team 494 Airborne Infantry Battalion. A clue to a secret page on this site uncovered a new audio recording, The Murder of Colonel Wilmot. While it's not possible to get the audio from the sources provided anymore, a transcript is written, and doesn't tell us much about the execution, except for the colonel's wish that his brother would receive his tags. The Ford Sleep Superbly video was uploaded, showing Infinity in a hotel room, he claims he's traveling for work and hasn't had any notable dreams lately, but he is thinking about bringing some of my new friends along for the trip. I know someone that would love to know where I'm going, but, well, she'll just have to wait. There's a shot of a book he's packing for reading material, mentioning how he's only on the third chapter, The Trial by Franz Kafka. Chapter 3 is titled The Empty Courtroom, which is the handle for a new Twitter account. This time, the profile picture appears to be blank but it's a QR code disguised using color adjustments. That leads to wrongyourright.com, a password-protected page until August 14, 2010. The site turns into a questionnaire with a number of statements that could result from going through it. There are far more who point out the wrongs than there are those who write them. Your refusal to partake does not keep the machine from moving. It simply diminishes your ability to steer. The choices that seem logical now may appear different in the future. You've chosen wisely, although your actions are not without consequence. You remain true to your agreement but can't help but feeling that there's something you missed. That final statement held a code that turned up juryof8.com with a username of recruiter and password of verdict. The landing page said, You are part of the recruiters for the jury of eight. The eight jurors should help bring the trial to the attention of a general public. Recruiters must find jurors who meet the follower ratio and have them retweet the statement, 
Someone's fate is in my hands in the jury of eights. Jury selection and passcodes will be announced on Twitter via empty courtroom daily at 5 p.m. EST. The jury of eight must be assembled by Tuesday, August 17th, 5.30 p.m. Eight boxes were provided to submit Twitter usernames, each specifying a certain number of followers, from 50 to 100,000. Those who actually followed up under the Twitter follower requirements were instructed to join a Ustream page called Empty Courtroom with a scheduled broadcast. Around the same time, the package from Heath Wellmont arrived, the colonel's dead brother. It contained three letters from the colonel to his brother, the first two of which asked Heath to come home. Joseph would care for him and keep him safe. The third was an imposter letter from Infinity, sending along the dog tags after the execution. He wrote, I hope you accept this as a token in my memory, as you will not see me again. I have spent most of my life commanding the lives of others in the name of my flag, but my power, I realize now, is not absolute. It is time I pledge my allegiance to a higher power, one that has already predetermined the course of events that have led you to receiving this letter. We gain a stronger sense here of why Infinity chose Wellmon as a victim. His position of lording over the fate of others inspired Infinity to show him the limits of his power. Next, the jury of eight is filled, and the Ustream goes live. We have video of this one, because Huntress recorded it herself. Uh, it's a shame I didn't have more time with her after she woke up, but I just couldn't risk it. Besides, I wanted you guys here for the grand reveal. She was surprisingly calm. I think in some weird way she understood it. Realized she wasn't above her own system. Not that my system has anything to do with hers, but I can't expect someone like that to see the bigger picture. And as it goes, the, the right perception of any matter and a misunderstanding of the same matter do not wholly exclude each other. But back to our little waiting game. 5.32, it won't be long now. Here comes our leading man on the dot. The curtain rises on the misfortune of some. Hello, Mr. Doorman. Goodbye, Mrs. Doorman. Hey guys, straight down to business today. As many of you already know, we may potentially have a new kill on our hands. You all discovered this audio, and um, well, judging from the sounds of it, we may already be too late. Okay, listen, my colleagues at the FBI are analyzing the track, but I need you to examine it too. This is vital now. I need every single one of you on this. I don't know what we're looking for. I don't even know if there's anything here, but what I do know is that this is the only lead we have. We have to get this guy. We cannot let the trail run cold. So let's start here. See where it takes us. Go hunt. Studying the audio of the killing and photo evidence supplied by Huntress tells the story. The tapping Infinity was doing turned out to be Morse code for the victim's name, Sarah Zizel. She was a circuit judge in Richmond, Virginia, and her execution was designed on the movement of a garage door. When Sarah's husband came home, he activated the garage door opener, which was hooked up to Sarah's car battery and Sarah herself. She was fried in a makeshift electric chair, and her husband was arrested as the only suspect, leaving Huntress and her followers to scramble for evidence to clear his name. Agent Pratt noted that she was worried for Tyler Zeisel's life. Virginia was a death penalty state, and the electric chair was an option for executions. Infinity's choice for this kill was very deliberate. Well acquainted by now with Infinity's MO for online staging, the players listened carefully to what was said during the judge's execution and caught a phrase, the misfortune, which was the hit for a website displaying a fortune-telling machine. The one and only misfortune. There was an image that said lucky numbers with a file name telling players to check again the next day. They followed instruction and received a file name change to a code that, when decrypted, converted to a YouTube channel with 12 videos showing a roulette wheel. Rearranging the tiles of the videos presented a statement. 
Years ago, I began by recognizing the difference between chance and fate. In each video, the roulette wheel spins, allowing the ball to fall on a number, putting the numbers in sequence according to the order for the statement made from the titles produced, of all things, an eBay listing code, posted by the seller, Mrs. Doorman Souvenir. It appears to be the judge's watch. Infinity follows up this surprise with Dream Therapy Session number 5, in which he tells Iris his trip was lovely. My friends ended up making it too, so I was quite excited. We all really pulled together. In fact, their efforts were downright... shocking. I got the feeling some of them didn't enjoy it though. I should have known. My kind of fun isn't really for most people. But oh well, I still had a great time. There was actually someone I've had my eye on for quite a while. She showed up as well. The look on her face. Be still my beating heart. But I must confess, my lifestyle hasn't been all that healthy. I certainly haven't gotten too much sleep. When I get wrapped up in my projects, it's hard to focus on anything else. I even become negligent, which is really not like me. But I have a little time before my next big move, so as you can tell, I'm soaking it all in. Now that you mention it, I'm almost getting a deja vu. I had a dream just last night about taking a nice warm bath. So as you can tell, I'm really listening to my dreams. So, where's the Twitter element this time? It's reflected in the opening statement that Infinity makes when Iris asks if he's ready for this session. Absolutely, I'm hanging on every word. Players were in for a real headache. Hanging on every word corresponded to every word of the transcript, leading to 64 different Twitter accounts each with an avatar that was one piece of a QR code. Crowdsource crime solving really came into play here. The sheer amount of guesswork and account detection that would have been involved for a single person is nauseating to think about. That QR code, when assembled from all those Twitter account avatars, led to a YouTube channel proposing a contest. Everybody's been there, everybody's felt it, everybody knows what it's like to have your heart ripped out. Heart ripped out heart ripped out. Tell us your story, we'll give you a prize. Reply to this video, or vote on the replies. We'll pick a winner, based on the top 8. By Monday the 23rd, so hurry, don't wait. Post a reply, with how you got your heart ripped out. Heart ripped out. Heart ripped out. Players get to work submitting, while those who went for the watch on eBay get their results. It sells for $300 to a player. But Infinity doesn't take the money, instead of asking simply for an address. Next, the contest on YouTube ends, with the user quite so scoring the prize. A bittersweet victory, considering the entry criteria. They'll be receiving a physical item for their troubles. It's unknown how the next Twitter account was found according to the timeline, but it's reported that F8 Speaks arrived, followed a bunch of players, and announced he would be hosting a chat. His clues lead players to an IRC chat used by players from Serial Huntress' forum, we have a log of this encounter, with Infinity's messages shown in bold. Information worth observing begins with the question, what are we missing? Infinity says, I can't tell you what you're missing. What can you tell us, two users ask. The path has already been opened, Infinity replies. Twice. Once for one, once for all. You can choose not to go down the path. It would be a shame though. I had such a nice treat waiting for you. The path began a long time ago, but the one I'm talking about right now was only pointed to recently. A user brings up a website that was found after the judge's death that didn't seem to be active yet, the Electric Girl. Infinity didn't take the bait there, opting instead to say, I will have to think of a different way to react if you find it. I admit I'm quite disappointed, but I still believe you can find it, even though you didn't quite make the deadline. He then seems to change course, adding, Electric girl, may be one of the reasons you haven't found the path. You stopped looking the right way. Angel, the timeline keeper, seems to catch one of the open threads. Should we go back to focusing on Tyler? Do you want him to be freed? Referring to the judge's husband, currently under investigation for her murder. Infinity says, Tyler, as if mulling on the thought, and then enters a smiley face. Other things of note. Infinity plays coy with answering if his next victim is a surgeon, mentions that Heath, the sanitarium patient, was a friend, and his next friend may be an old one. Sarah's eyes all he was told made a friend of his cry, 
and he knew more of Sarah than she did of him. Infinity admits he seeks out friendship based on shared interests. He reminds players that the path they're missing is much more timely than they realize, and gives a nod to Angel again for asking if Tyler and Joe, the colonel, ever work together. Infinity highlights how a lot of good connections have been noticed between his friends, but any attempt to compare him to someone else, like Dexter Morgan, Miami's Bay Harbor Butcher, may be keeping them from noticing the true thread. Infinity leaves, and shortly after, players discover a website based on a Fate Speaks tweet, Operating.com, a game modeled after Operation with the goal of making an incision under a timer. Success resulted in an audio clip of heart monitor failure, and under the chaos of an emergency room response, a question, lost anything valuable lately? Asking Infinity that question on Twitter got a response about a dark green utility jacket he lost on a trip to New York. He remembers the location and leaves players to go hunt it down. They call that location, the bodies exhibit in New York, and ask about the jacket, receiving confirmation of its presence, but no one is close enough to get it. Infinity is pleased anyway and hints at a surprise reward. Hunters provides a briefing where the surprise drops. Hey guys, thanks for joining. I'm gonna assume that by now you've all seen the killer's little publicity tour. Sick bastard is f***ing with us. He's trying to turn this into his 15 minutes of fame. Do not let him. Now is the time to buckle down and put your heads together and do some really good detective work. I need one of you to start a thread dedicated exclusively to consolidating our theories for the killer's MO. We need to figure this out now. He's obviously motivated by something related to fate, but I think there's a bigger picture. That theme has come up over and over again, but serial killers tend to have a vision. They create their own set of rules, and they are extremely consistent. We can use that. I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys come up with, so thanks in advance. Keep hunting. Agent Pratt addresses what occurred quickly in a follow-up, urgent update. Well, I was just informed what happened during the last briefing. I'm sure you all witnessed it. This is bold, even for him. The video briefing is now officially evidence. I'm already analyzing it, as I'm sure you guys are. I'm going to leave it up as is so that we can continue to do so. Let's find out what he's trying to communicate ASAP. The one thing we know for certain? He thinks this is a game. He enjoys f***ing with us. But I'll tell you what. There is no way in hell that he can outwit all of us together. I'm assuming he's watching right now. Infinity, do you think this is a game? This is not a game. And we are coming for you. For the rest of you, go hunt. Analyzing the fifth briefing video turned up two hidden image frames showing the words heart and recipes. But before players could think about what to do with that, Infinity responded to Huntress with a reverse upload of 5th Briefing that included his symbol and a smiley face in the title. Two more hidden messages are caught, My and Healthy. Put it all together and you have My Healthy Heart Recipes, the next website, which contained hidden coordinates and recipe instructions outlining a dead drop in LA that Friday. The physical item aspect of the game ramped up from here. The watch winner received their prize and found the back was engraved with the name of the judge, Sarah Zizel. Opening it revealed a slip of paper with the title for a webpage, sarahzizel.com slash unanimous, protected by a series of usernames and passwords. It was here the information attributed to the jury of eight came into play, unlocking security camera footage that showed Infinity entering Sarah Zizel's home, two minutes before her husband, Tyler, came home and activated the garage door. A message was left for viewers. You are now in a position to decide the fate of another. Choose wisely, but know that your actions are not without consequence. That solves the message about Infinity's unexplored path being timely. The ability to save Tyler was hidden inside the judge's watch. As for the other item, the jacket, that was recovered by a player who found an Infinity symbol embroidered inside and a sewn-up pocket containing a flash drive. On the drive was a password-protected zip file, barring access to an MP3. Now, for the dead drop. That was pointed at a hospital featured in the first season of Dexter. 
Odd language from the Healthy Heart Recipe site mentioning a need to check in on the meals led players to examine the social app Foursquare on the drop date. They got a hit. A user named Rip Your Heart Out checked in at the location and a park nearby, leaving a pager number on their posts. The players at the scene called the pager and listened for the vibration to physically track down the drop, which was a medical wastebasket. It held a white pill with a number 78 imprinted on it, a burned bone, the pager, and four thank you cards addressed to Dr. Brooke Walter. One was from a boy named Ian, thanking her for saving his father. The next, a woman named Phyllis, whose life was saved by Dr. Walter's work. Another from a man named Dwayne, thanking her for the same. And the last, an anonymous card, saying, You have changed the lives of so many, and I must admit that I am no exception. In a way, you've given me a new beginning as well. It's quite ironic if you think about it. By altering fate's path on so many occasions, you have also sealed your own. Thank you. P.S. Thanks for letting me borrow your syringes. They came in handy. Searches for Brooke Walter uncovered her website, set up by friends and family who wanted to help in finding her murderer. Dr. Walter was killed three years prior. Okay, guys. It's been an interesting week, but as usual, you guys are keeping up the good work. You did an excellent job finding the pager and identifying Dr. Brooke Waldor. I contacted her family through the website that you found and shared the circumstances with them. And as sad as their situation is, just learning the truth about her killer really made a difference for them. Thank you for that. Clearly, they still want justice, and it is our job to give it to them. I've contacted the police, and they have been kind enough to provide us with images of the murder scene. Dr. Waldor was murdered in her own bathtub in Los Angeles. Her heart was literally cut out. Sick bastard. There's really not a lot more that I have to say this week, so keep on top of your game. Check back in on Tuesday. I'll see you then. There was another update from Huntress during this time. Bringing her the footage from Zara Zizel's house was found to be inadmissible in its current state, since Infinity had uploaded it backwards, showing it was tampered with. Huntress did note it looked like he stopped to take something off Zara's dog's collar on his way into the house, however, leaving players with yet another open end towards saving Mr. Zizel. As players talked about next steps, the winner of the Rip Your Heart Out contest received their prize. A medical award for excellence in heart surgery addressed to Dr. Walder with the Infinity symbol carved into it. Unscrewing the backplate uncovered a message. Save Kill. This was the password for the jacket flash drive, uncovering the MP3 file Extirpation, an audio recording of Dr. Walder's death. Infinity mocks the narrative of movements a surgeon would make during a procedure, describing his steps as he removes the doctor's heart. Five victims covered, the latest from years prior. Players held their breath as therapy session number six was uploaded. Infinity discusses how he and his friends had a real heart-to-heart -heart recently, and there isn't much news otherwise, but his local paper has some bizarre classified ads. He reports he's been sleeping like a log and says he has to go. He's just gotten back from a run and his muscles are burning. Players honed in immediately on his shirt, a destination tee from Philadelphia, and began scaring the local papers. Agent Pratt beats them to the discovery, posting this ad on page 66. Your fate, my fortune. We met a few years ago. Without you, I would never be where I am, and I am very close to where I need to be. I could call you my personal hero, my hero on fire. The last phrase, of course, led to Twitter and a string of three other accounts, which, with profile pictures combined, presented the name of the next website, PrometheusByFate.com. This one involved a new trick. Pressing the F8 key while at the website played an audio file composed of the notes F-A-D-E-D. Typing that in rhythm with the audio brought up a video clip from Therapy Video 6 highlighted in red, which looped for 11 turns and showed the phrase, Fight or Fade, the next website. A text alert number on the site was provided for alerting subscribers to any fire alarms. Players could text it to register for the service. At the bottom of the page, a Ustream account was listed with a set of controls. F to go forward, L to go left, R to go right. Huntress came through with the next update. She managed to get a hold of the dog collar from Sarah's house and found Infinity had replaced the tag with this message, a quote from Einstein heavily edited, which was also Infinity's profile message on the sleep therapy site. 
The same day, those registered for the fire alarm site received an alert and rushed online to steer a fire truck towards its destination in a game, as a group. On their third try, they succeeded, and the victory was recorded. say I'm keen to find irony in these situations. This time it really doesn't take much effort. <laughs> Fight fire with fire, it's almost too easy. Even today, how your habit to jump to the rescue made you end up on this dusty floor. But tell me how that isn't fate. I guess this must be a very silly notion to you. You don't deal in fate. You deal in courage, and saving lives, and defeating the odds. You see, my friend, that's where you're wrong. See, having others owe their lives to you, clinging to your chest, holding on to you for dear life, oh, being a hero is almost as gratifying as being a killer. Not to mention much more socially acceptable. But I see through your little selfless act and the whole breed of career superheroes like you. Because I know that every time you throw yourself into the flames, you're hooked on being in control of the lives you save, and most importantly, of your own. Well, here's the trick. Nobody's ever in control of their fate. And pour enough gas, even superheroes burn. Okay guys, I think you all know what the deal is, so let's just get right to it. I received this package, I opened it, and I think it's pretty clear who it came from. Okay guys, look, I'm going to examine this cake through and through, but it's pretty clear that these letters have some kind of relevance. We've seen how he operates, so it's clear that he's trying to lead us somewhere, but where? I need you guys to help me figure out where he wants us to go. But as well, I think we need to look at the bigger picture. He hacked us twice last week, and now this? He's turning his focus on us. Or on me. It's almost as if it's becoming personal. There are some things in my past. Look, I made a lot of arrests during my years at the FBI, and I pissed off a lot of people. And I have been racking my brains trying to figure out if there's some kind of a connection there, but it's not clear yet, so until it is, we're just gonna have to take what he gives us and see where it goes. Look, guys, he's getting closer, but it is imperative that we not get intimidated. We do not get intimidated that easily. So whatever sick and twisted little message this is, we will figure it out, as we always do. And we will track him down. We will follow him to the gates of hell and beyond, if that is what it takes. Because I am not afraid of you, Infinity. I'm just determined. All right, guys, go hunt. Agent Pratt eventually updates her blog confirming nothing is wrong with the cake aside from the code and the frosting and the fact the serial killer sent it. She does know that any form of decoding may have to do with the number eight, however, and to keep in mind that Infinity is some kind of computer specialist. Before proceeding, it occurs to me to take a moment and observe what you may be feeling, which I myself am experiencing as we explore this case a second-hand experience of being a player in this story. We may not have any codes to break ourselves or websites to uncover, but the rush is there, as well as the intrigue, isn't it? The need to know, the desire for more, and certainly the challenge that players at the time dealt with. What exactly is Infinity's reason for selecting victims? At the onset, my thoughts were that he selected victims whose ability to interfere in the fate of others caused them serious misfortune. The identity thief, the drug dealer, the judge, the colonel. Killing people in this way would have made Infinity a definite sort of Dexter figure. An anti-hero, using his homicidal addiction to do some form of good in the world. The last two victims make it very clear this is not the case. 
murdering a successful heart surgeon and a fireman? That immediately breaks any theory of moral compass for Infinity, and instead lines up the idea that his victims are chosen for the enormity of their interference with fate overall. That by their actions, good or evil, they have committed an atrocity against the natural order. This would make him, as he outlined on Twitter in his first set of riddles, the third fate, death, a grim reaper come to bring punishment for changing how lives are meant to play out. There's also the suspicion that there will only be two more victims, falling in line with the code of eight Infinity has used all along. We'll see about that in short time. But for now, let's give ourselves a break from the hunt. We've gone through a lot of websites, Twitter accounts, and motifs for one night. We'll continue the case of the Infinity Killer and meet our fate in part two very soon. I'd like to thank Raycon for joining us for part one of this investigation with a sponsorship and offer for Nightmind viewers. All of you for watching, and my supporters on Patreon, who I know would hunt a serial killer with me if I ever asked. You can help support the work I do on Nightmind and through the Nightmind Index by becoming a Patreon supporter too, for as low as just $2 a month. Every bit helps, and I appreciate it immensely. Stick around to see the names of all these creatures of the night in just a moment. If you're feeling empty on content to hold you over until part two, consider exploring the projects in the Nightmind Index. With my last update, there are now at least 80 entries, and I have no doubt you'll find some new unfiction experiences that excite you from the index card view alone. Remember, you won't just be finding new content before I cover it, you'll be supporting new and underdiscovered creators in the field, which benefits unfiction as a whole. That's all for now, everyone. Thanks for joining me in the dark again this evening. I'm Nick Nocturne, and like our new favorite fatalist antagonist, I'll be back again real soon. Until then, sleep superbly.